Thank you so much, Loring, um, for the kind invitation to talk today. And thanks for Talking Galleries, for organizing the symposium. Thanks for everybody to be here. Um, really delighted to be with my esteemed colleagues, so thank you so much. Um, we're going to do a, a little radical shift from our last panel to focus on models from the Caribbean, so a completely different arts ecology. And um, I'm going to just introduce our speakers very briefly. Christopher Cozier is an artist living and working in Trinidad and a co-director of Alice Yard, a collective which will be participating in Documenta 15. He was awarded a Paula Krasner Foundation grant in 2004 and of the Prince Claus Award Laureate in 2013. Through his notebook drawings to installations derived from recorded staged actions, Cozier investigates how Caribbean historical and current experiences can inform understandings of the wider contemporary world. Exhibitions include the Brooklyn Museum, Afro-Modern Journeys to the Black Atlantic, Tate Liverpool, Entanglements at the Broad Art Museum, Michigan, and Relational Undercurrents at MOLA, LA. Sara Herman is chief curator at Centro León in Santiago, Dominican Republic, where she has worked since 2005. Sara was director at the Museo de Arte Moderno of Dominican Republic from 2000 to 2004. She serves as member of the International Art Advisory Council of Caribbean Arts Initiative, a platform that supports contemporary art and artists in the Caribbean region. Hedemann is also one of the founders of Curando Caribe, a pedagogical program for contemporary arts and curation established since 2014. As a curator, Sara works with artists whose practices derives from the Caribbean, Central, Latin America, and its diasporas. Tavares Strong received a BFA in glass from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2003 and an MFA in sculpture from Yale University in 2006. Strong's work has been featured in numerous solo exhibitions, including You Belong Here, Prospect 3, Biennial, New Orleans, The Immeasurable Daydream, Biennale de Lyon, Polar Eclipse, The Bahamas National Pavilion, 55th, Venice Biennale, Seen Unseen, Undisclosed Exhibition, New York, Orthostatic Tolerance, It Might Not Be Such a Bad Idea If I Never Went Home Again, MIT List Visual Arts Center, Cambridge, among many others. So thank you so much for joining me. Welcome, Sara, Christopher, and Tobias. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks, for, nice thanks for being here. So in preparation for this talk, I wrote a few thoughts that I thought would contextualize our discussion, um, just being that we're in talking galleries and it's a completely different conversation that we're going to have. The cultural field is undergoing profound changes. Amidst calls for racial justice and the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, audiences, artists, and communities have accelerated their claims for a diverse, equitable, and welcoming museum. In a way, one can say that many museums are undergoing a crisis of identity, as the art world has become increasingly more disconnected from the realities of our time. Clearly, we must change and take risks. But what should be the role of the museum today, and how can we build, alongside artists and their work, a more just and equitable world? Many of us in the cultural field keep asking ourselves these questions. But where shall we look for inspiration and guidance during these times? And what if, instead of looking for new models and methods north to the US and Europe, or to the language and strategies of corporate America, we look towards the Caribbean instead. What models and methodologies can the Caribbean provide to guide us forward as we continue our work to redefine and reframe mm -hmm. the institutional landscape in the US? In the Caribbean, lack of adequate arts funding and arts infrastructure and a fragile public education system where the arts are not prioritized has fueled numerous artistic and educational projects initiated by artists and curators. They're all working in shifting social, political, and ecological frameworks in colonial and post-colonial contexts. Projects that are born out of the needs of their immediate contexts and communities and nurtured through ongoing relationships, collaborations, and exchanges. These are some of the questions that are guiding my thinking today as we start this panel. 
So I invited you three because you have spaces or you've created projects of learning and exchange in the region that I think are important to look at today. And Chris, maybe let's start with you. Okay. Um, we've had so many conversations mm -hmm. through the years and I think that some of those dialogues have been really important for me as I shaped my curatorial voice and my interest as a young curator and even today, I mean, we're working together on this sh upcoming show. Um, and I think that, you know, you have been such an important interlocutor for so many artists and curators in the region. Um, and I can think of so many artists that have passed through Alice Yard that I've spoken to that um, can really talk about those dialogues and how important they have, uh, they have been for them. And you founded, co-founded Alice Yard in 2006. And that space has become so important in the region. And maybe you might disagree, but I think it has become a type of educational space mm -hmm. um, for many curators and artists coming through Trinidad, but coming from different parts of the Caribbean. And mainly because, you know, there's a lack of postgraduate degrees in the region. So it's a type of postgraduate, even informal um, program. Um, can you talk about, you know, who is Alice Yard? What is Alice Yard? And why did you start this project? Okay, sure. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, well I, I would start by saying that it's a, it's a learning experience for all involved, for us as well, the founders. Um, how Alice Yard it wasn't launched or founded in a conventional way. Um, what happened is in uh, around 2006, um, we were, a couple of artists wanted to sort of have a project out in the public domain. They were kind of tired of the white box, the, the certain circumstances under which they were showing all along. We had done a number of experiments of that nature before in a previous organization called CCA7 in, um, and um, so we were planning the event, and one of the artists, a young videographer, performance person, said, I need an old backyard uh, with a moldy old room. And, um, and I called Sean, a, a colleague of mine, an architect, Sean Leonard. Um, he had such a backyard. And, uh, and the artist basically said, um, this could work, Sean offered to clean it out a little bit, you know, make it habitable. And she did a video installation that stayed in that space for about two weeks. And Sean was very excited because that backyard was a family space that children played, um, people designed carnival costumes. <laughs> it was a kind of social space for family and the community around in a 1930s suburb of the city port of Spain in Trinidad. What no one was expecting is that once that gesture had taken place in that space, the space had been reactivated, so to speak, Sean's phone started ringing. <laughs> another artist, another <laughs> artist. And so I said, look, I'm an architect, I don't have time for this. You know, you're the artist, you know how to talk to them. And of course, I am not, I'm an artist, I'm working in my studio, I don't wanna get involved in scheduling and planning and, you know? So I called yeah. another friend, Nicholas Lachlan, who was a writer, um, he curates the Bocalit Festival in the Caribbean, you know, and things like that, He's a, and he said, okay, I, I, I'll talk to them, so you will be next month on that date, and so on, and that's how it started. Um, we were responding to a demand it, it was almost like a default setting was, you know, like people needed space to do things. And Sean was very excited by it because, um, you know, the sense of play and collaboration. So it, it wasn't burdensome on anyone. It didn't cost anything. Or somebody calls, they want to do something. Sean calls me, I call Nicholas, you know, and we go down to the yard. And then suddenly within the space of about a month or two, Artists just started going there and sitting in the backyard because it, the yard itself never closed. It was open 24-7. Mm. Oh. And that's when the process began. And so we started discovering something about what we could be as well as you were discovering something about the context, you know. Um, and yard spaces are part of a larger Caribbean tradition. Um, you were coming out of, you know, the barrackyards, 
sites of settlement. So if you study the history of Port of Spain or any Caribbean city uh, that started in the post-emancipation period where people left the plantations, moved into urban areas, settled in these yard-like spaces. In the context of Trinidad, it has a dualistic quality because you have the African settlement, you have the Asian one, and you have the Amerindian one as well, which is a kind of circle with a great, you know, one dominant house in the middle and a kind of central yard. And a lot of, a lot of cultural production in the Caribbean comes out of those kinds of social collaborative spaces. So um, we found ourselves involved in something very traditional, um, sort of reactivating it because these things were normally applied to traditional cultural practices, mm -hmm. you know, like the carnival or folk things and so on. So suddenly here we are doing a contemporary um, facilitation collaboratively in a kind of yard space. Um, and to close off that response, because um, we were discovering this along the way, uh, what we found ourselves in, um, in an almost archetypal way. And uh, <laughs> um, people then started looking at us and saying, so you're all are alternative spaces, you're all avant-garde spaces. And we said, no, we are very traditional. This is an archetypal, almost Jungian kind of enterprise. You know? This kind of <laughs> concept has been in our societies in every island for hundreds of years since, you know, from the Amerindian period yeah. to the Spanish conquest, to the colonial enterprise, to the kind of post-emancipation period. And uh, I'll leave it there. And then <laughs> yeah, one more question, because, yeah. you know, yeah. the Caribbean is so heterogeneous, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's like packed into like this one space. Yeah. And Trinidad in particular is very different, right, from the rest of the mm -hmm. islands in terms of like um, not having that tourist economy that we see perhaps in yeah. the DR or in the Bahamas or in other or in Barbados. Can, can you talk specifically about um, the audience that comes to Alice Yard and what is important about Belmont, that particular neighborhood in Port of Spain? Okay. Well, we started in Woodbrook first, um, and Woodbrook, Woodbrook was, is a 1930s suburb. And it was famous for things like the Little Carib Theatre, people like Beryl McBurney, who moved back and forth with Harlem. You know, um, on one experience I had was when we first started, a guy walked into the yard and said, you young people, you all do it, do it, do it. I said, why? He said, well, I saw Paul Robeson sing off of a balcony two houses away. I said, what? Yes, and that is what became the Little Carib Theatre back in the 30s into the 40s. I said, wow, so I, good. Um, so... Things like that were going on all the time, but that was a family space. And then we moved from Woodbrook to Belmont. And Belmont, to give you a quick thing, it was Freetown in the early 19th century because um, um, when the British and, you know, lost interest conveniently in the slave trade, they would intercept ships and release the people in Trinidad. Also, a lot of Afro-Americans um, who, well, they weren't Afro-Americans, in a pure sense, but they fought on the side of the British in the War of 1812. They were offloaded in Trinidad as well. So you had this, these populations coming in. And um, so it started as Freetown, and as the middle class culture evolved of free coloreds in the mid uh, 19th century, it changed into Belmont, a suburb of the city, kind of middle class, you know, mm -hmm. nurses, policemen, that kind of thing. But it became known for reading societies, debating societies. So all the famous people you read about, like Stokely Carmichael in, of late, or C.L.R. James, or all these people come from places like, you know, or if they didn't come from Belmont, they associated in places like Belmont. So it's a kind of community that has a tradition of cultural dialogues and so on. So when we moved there um, to a space that we had more autonomy, it was a very interesting thing. The like if we decided to do an event, people in the community would come out of their houses and put rubber made chairs out in front of their house, bring out coolers, bring out their grandparents, bring out children, fold their arms and watch us and say, well, now we <laughs> want to know why are they here? You know, like do something, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, and of course there's a confluence and a fluidity with the community, which is something we were a little bit taken aback by. But then my family, uh, when my family migrated to Trinidad after the Second World War, my parents did. I was born in Trinidad. Belmont was a point of settlement. So I was actually born in that community and spent you know, the early years of my school life there. So it was, it was like a returning for me. 
Um, I mean, one or two people even recognized me, which is shocking. You know, it's that kind of community. Like you could be on a train in Brooklyn and somebody will look at you and wave and say, oh, you went to Belmont Boys RSC Primary School. I'm like, good Lord, how do you remember my face? You know? <laughs> and we are talking about I'm six, seven years old. You know, so it's that kind of community. So, um, so we move there and, and we find ourselves in a community where people are, you know, very excited to kind of see what we will do, what kind of value we, we will bring to their community. But you don't, you don't see it as a pedagogical space or an education? Well, of course, we, there's a principle, an idea about play collaboration, which we are tapping into, and, but it's also we are learning from them, you know, because this is how they've always done it. So we have, in other words, they come and say, well, no, nah, we've done this before. You know, like, you better go around the corner and talk to so-and-so, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, so you could, you could, it's that kind of community, if you see what I'm saying. A lot of our talks, we open a big industrial door onto the street, and sometimes people walking by stop and say, listen, a fella did talk about that, you know, and it's okay, sorry, you know, like, and they join the conversation. And there's a constant conversation right now outside the yard that I can't even keep up with. Like, older people come and sit in a circle at the front entrance every night and talk till all hours. It's really bizarre. I mean, I, I have to go home and see about my studio, my family. <laughs> I, I get pulled into that, and next thing you know, <laughs> it's that kind of space. So yeah, there's a dialogue, is what I mean, an yeah. exchange. It's not an that exchange. we are bringing, you know, kind of, I mean, the word pedagogy is interesting, but it's, <clears throat> it's frightening in terms of, you know, because we have a kind of cultural pedagogy and hierarchy in terms of how culture, uh, you know, like the school teacher, the, the mm -hmm. cultural activists, you know, mm -hmm. that we inherited through independence and nationalism oh, yes. and so on that I'm a little bit nervous about, you know. Using that word, yeah. Huh? No, but I think I, it's, I don't it's really be, based on yeah. that you yeah, know, yeah. exchange, which I get it, for yeah. you has been really important as an artist yeah. in terms of the Caribbean as a space of exchange, right? Oh, no, certainly, yeah. 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 And I think it's a good segue to mm. talk about to you, Tavares, about some of the work that you're doing in the Bahamas. And, um, you know, you're, you're a very accomplished artist. You, your work really circulates in certain areas of the art world. But perhaps what is less known is some of the projects that you're doing on the ground in the Bahamas with schools. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the foundation that you started. Why did you feel there was a yeah. need? And um, you know, how do you see that project developing at the moment? Yeah, that's a little bit of a long story. <laughs> um, so why, for example, Oku Foundation? Why Oku? Why the name Oku? Yeah, I mean, I think to speak to what Chris was talking about earlier, the, the word pedagog words like pedagogy and school scare me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because I feel like school, um, when, you, when you take a bunch of black children and teach them European history, mm. it's a fertile way of teaching them how to hate themselves. Mm. Um, and so in the, the neighborhood I was raised in, I had a phenomenal art teacher from England and there was this drawing competition. Um, and she said, you should, of course, you like to draw, you should be a part of this competition. And she was about six foot two. Um, she had like a, an arch, a bob when she walked. And, um, and she said, you should, you should draw. And I drew and I won this competition when I was 12. And she said that, you know, you, you get to use this money later on. And I think it was the, the seed that sprouted and became the foundation that I'm working on now, which is something called Oku, OKU, which is a, a West African word, which means beacon or light. And the idea is that in Bahamas, that we'll provide the same seed funding for every first grader when they enter the first grade. And then this will accrue interest over time, and then they will collect this money when they, when they hit a maturation point and can um, provide a vision of what their future might, might be. And so that's one dimension of, of, of the foundation. I think there are other, the other dimensions of it have to do with programs and artists and residency programs that investigate and interrogate models for education in general. Because like I said before, when you sit down a bunch of Afro kids in a room and teach them about Christopher Columbus, it does doable damage to them as people. Mm. And I think we need to consider, reconsider how we manage words like education. 
Um, and so I think we're looking, obviously we're looking at that also. Um, so just, just for some context, we have about 400 and, 400 and so thousand people in the country. And so that's roughly about 4,000 children per year that enter the first grade in the system. And the reason why this is significant is because in terms of public resource, by the time the child hits five years old, they, there wasn't any pre-education. So the, this create, you create this education deficit in the country. So by the time the child is, is ready to go to school, um, you're dealing with someone who's probably never really opened a book or um, never had any exposure or brain stimulation in a way that one might have if one was exposed, pre-exposed in other environments. And so the foundation is a, is a, a kind of an approach that is meant to short the political system because politicians tend to think of, of problems in four to five year chunks. And this is probably a 15 year um, go at it. And, um, and the idea is that if you, if you think through these, these problems that are longer problems, they, they developed over long, long periods of time, to try and resolve them in, in a political cycle is, um, is absurd. And so the foundation is, is hoping to address some of these critical issues in the community. Um, so yeah. And how do, how do you see you know, the foundation um, contributing or functioning within the, the social context of Nassau? Is it just Nassau or like, like further out or? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, the, the, in principle, I think what we're hoping is that this becomes a, a model for the region and then for, for communities that are mirroring this kind of community, these kinds of communities, regardless of geography. Um, the advantage of, of Nassau as a city is, and the Bahamas as a country, is it's small enough to kind of proof concept. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully we can, we can start to think about this as a model for change, shifting education in general across the, the region and then, and then the world. I think when you, when you study the, the, the Caribbean, so what is the Caribbean, right? This is the question. <laughs> when, well. you, when, you, when you think about what it is um, and you dig into its history, you know, Nassau, the city that I was born in, obviously the word Nassau is a Dutch word. We were occupied by the French, the Spanish, obviously the British. So there are these um, deep, deep uh, and profound and existential European connections that um, the Western world loves to pretend not, they don't exist. And so when you think of words like art, it's difficult to say the word art without thinking about um, creative practice in the Caribbean, for example. Some of the first cities in the Western Hemisphere existed in the Caribbean. Most of the wealth that exists in this world that we live in is in this theater that we're sitting in is probably brought to you by folks who were in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's difficult for me to think about the Caribbean without thinking about the success of the West. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, know, you probably accelerated um, this project in the last two years, but you've been thinking a lot about this project in particular, and I know that um, the project that you did in Venice um, when you represented the, the Bahamas is very much connected to this project when you brought these school children yeah. um, over to Venice. Can you talk about that, that experience, how transformative it was for these children and, and maybe how that prompted you to think more deeply about the yeah. type of work that you wanna do mm -hmm. down there? Yeah, I think, I think every professional um, is, is making, making work that will allow them to speak to their child itself. And I think if you, if you think about what audience is, and I think, you know, when you, I have, as you read in, in your um, introduction, I have this highfalutin, high-powered American education. Um, and I think one of the things that, that you forget is who your audience is. And I think, for me, my audience has always been the childhood version of myself. And so much of the things that I like to think about and make are things that I was, had longing for or didn't have, things that were absent from my experience as a child. Um, in some ways and present in other ways. And so in, in the Biennale in Venice, I had this phenomenal opportunity to bring this group of students who'd never left the island before into Venice for the Biennale. And at the time I was doing all of this research on these lost histories of, of, of black exploration, specifically the story of Matthew Henson. Mm -hmm. 
who was the first person to make it to the North Pole who looks exactly like me. And we also had this opportunity to work with these indigenous communities in the North, and they taught uh, these students this language, these dying languages, and they were able to come to Venice and perform these dying languages that wasn't, they weren't languages that they were familiar with. They learned them for the Biennale, and they performed them in the spaces, the, the opening to um, the Biennale. But I, again, I think it goes back to, you know, knowing one's roots, one's origins, and oneself, and thinking about reflecting those principles back into the, the community spaces that we all inhabit, right? So I want to turn to you, Sara, because you know you have an incredible project, Curando Caribe, curating the Caribbean that mm -hmm. is really responsive to you know the needs of the local community, the needs of artists and curators. Can you talk about how this project started, and in particular, <laughs> maybe also talk about your approach to curating, which I think is really interesting because it's very different from how we define it here in the U.S. So, well, yes, it's, uh, thank you so much, Carla. I'm thrilled to be with uh, Tavares and Chris in this environment and with you, of course. <clears throat> um, to start, I would like to quote um, David Breslin and Adrienne Edwards. Uh, they wrote for the Whitney Biennial, something that I think is very appropriate for everything we are talking right now. It's cultural, aesthetic, and political possibility begins with meaningful exchange and reciprocity. And with that idea in mind, and with all the caution that uh, Tavares said, that we have to take with education, not only the word education, but also the act of educating, and with the um, I think the feeling of this circular community building uh, gatherings that happens in Alice, in Alice uh, Yard, we made Curando Caribe. Curando Caribe, uh, and I am sorry to say for the gentleman that did the questions in the African panel, that it's also a result of a lack of uh, infrastructure and absence of academic uh, framework, and also a lack. Uh, it was a lack of, medi of mediation of uh, of the art that was growing and the cultural needs of the society. So, uh, Curando Caribe, uh, it is a hybrid and multidisciplinary. Uh, program that is focused on cultural, um, curatorial studies. And, but it proclaims uh, some sort of uh, emancipation of teaching and learning, and as a consequence, as it uh, produces a curatorial practice that is a little bit, it's non-orthodox, it's, it's different. It's a pedagogical program, it is, it is, I have to say, that it was uh, uh, created to respond to the precarious uh, art system, uh, the lack of mediation, as I said, and the absence of academic uh, framework. But also, it was created because of the need of visibility. And I think it was, uh, it was talked before, and I'm not talking about the visibility of the documentas and, and the blockbuster exhibitions. I'm talking regional and local. Uh, visibility, and it's, it's that we all know what, what we are doing, and this is only this only you can do through medi mediators. Um, it's, this is a program that it takes place every year since 2014, eight years. I can tell in retrospective that we have 25 alumni working in different parts of the world, the Caribbean included. The four are working with me in the Centro Leon, which is a nonprofit uh, private institution in Santiago, the Dominican Republic. And it is the, the, it's a program that was built by two institutions. This nonprofit uh, private inst institution, and that is not in the center of the city, that is an, in, a, in a city called Santiago de los Caballeros, which is 165 kilometers away from Santo Domingo. 
And that is the third city in population in the country, making Manhattan the second city in population in the Dominican Republic. As you may know, we have 846,000 Dominicans living in Manhattan. So that was a fact, just, just you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> in every uh, New Yorker, there's a Dominican as well. So, and this, uh, this project uh, has uh, the vocation of being nomadic, of being flex flexible, of being uh, collectible, and also to be um, a space for sharing knowledge. That's why when we talk about the curatorial studies, not only we think about the exhibition history or the ideological history of exhibits, but also the oral traditions, uh, the musical tradition, and um, crate making, because um, it's not a news for anybody that, that curators in our context uh, usually have to make crates as well, as to produce uh, projects. It's not, it's not and unusual. And install the artwork. And install the artwork. And clean the space. And clean the space. <laughs> so um, when we started this project with Centro Cultural de España and Centro León eight years ago, we also um, defined something that was very important for us. Not only um, who our audiences were, because I think that's very important, and also to locate yourself where you, from where do you act and speak, and speak to people, but we had to find uh, in the curatorial something more than this production of meaning, like very cryptic in a museum. And we thought, and we sustain from there on that the curatorial is an act of responsibility, not a mere thing of, of authorship. It's not, a, the curatorial endeavor is a, a, a collective experience. We don't understand that I have never, ever, I've been working in this field 32 years, and I have never, ever made a curatorial work by myself. Yeah. So it's not possible, it's not possible, well, maybe the genius is around there, but there's not possible that this, this very um, risk-taking, a very hard uh, work is made by one person. So it has to be thought as a collective endeavor and as an act of responsibility. You are signing a check, you are not signing a book. You are acting as a responsible person for what is shown. And you have to be responsible for not only uh, your words, but everybody's there. You have to, to um, be able to uh, protect the integrity of the artistic language, the artistic practice, and the artist. So, and that's, uh, that's our main uh, issue. It's not only to think of it collectively, but to go back to care. I think everybody here have heard a lot the idea of uh, uh, curatorial as curare, to take care of, etymologically speaking, from the Latin. But that's what we aim for, uh, to, is to go back to care. To care not only in terms of uh, of to care for the, the product, the exhibition product, but the integrity of everything you deal with. If it's archives, uh, artistic practice, artists, you have to go back to care and establish, as you have pointed out so many times, relationships, meaningful relationships. Mm. No, that's something that, like I feel like my practice as a curator, the most important thing are those relationships. You know, that's, yeah. that's literally what is holding the practice together. And earlier in the panel of museum directors, they were talking about collaboration and, and partnerships as like a, mm -hmm. future, like a future vision for the museum. But I feel like we've always worked in that way in the yes. Caribbean out of necessity. Like we've always worked collaboratively and we've always had an approach to the collective that is very different from a sort of US-centric approach to collaboration or collectivity. Mm -hmm. 
And I feel all of your projects really are, are thinking about that very deeply. Um, and I'm also thinking that your artistic practices are also collaborative, even your curatorial practices. I mean, you and I are scheming to do something yeah. in the near future. Um, you work very collaboratively, um, Chris, with um, your co-founders, but also I feel like you know, your work shapes Alice Yard, and Alice Yard in turn shapes your artistic practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, more and more. <laughs> so maybe we can, because I know Tavares as well, there's, there's so much that I understood about your work when I learned about these efforts in, in the Bahamas. So maybe, Chris, you can start us off by, you know, thinking a little bit about this exchange that is happening between Alice Yard and your practice as an artist, and, and sort of this continuous exchange that is, that is being enacted um, through your projects? Well, I think, I mean, I see an artist almost like an instigator curator in a way, you know, I, 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 because, you know, you, sometimes you, 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 things occur to you either through what you observe people doing or you have this idea and then you're trying to kind of convince others that it's useful so that they can take it up with you to carry it to some other point because sometimes you can't carry it all the way on your own. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I have discovered um, it's context building, yes. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I've found over the years, uh, it took me a little while because we talk about unlearning, um, you know, well, yes, we have a little bit of that in, in the context of Trinidad as well. I am of the generation where I, I as a small child, I learned about the War of Roses, <laughs> that the Caribbean curriculum of Caribbean history set in by the time I was like maybe 13 or 14 years old. But when I was younger, in the 60s into the 70s, I basically was learning about the history of Europe yeah. from the Caribbean. And then I went, came here and I was in art school, you know. Um, I went to Micah and I did graduate school in Rutgers in the 80s and stuff. And I actually ran out of here because I, I, I felt, well, you know, in that era of the, um, sort of mid to late 80s, you know, art, there was this premise that art only happened in four blocks downtown in New York, right? And the rest of the world was in the boonies. And, um, <laughs> and I, I just, I was freaking out, you know? <laughs> so I decided I'll just go out into the nowhere space. But, um, so I felt like I was becoming an eloquent voyeur, you know? I sort of read all these books and seen all these shows in New York and whatever. So I kind of went into the Caribbean. When I went back into the Caribbean, it was just around the time of the Dominican, um, the Santo Domingo Biennial, the Havana Biennial. I would go across to Caracas and see the, um, the Pirelli show and different mm -hmm. events that were telling me, wait a minute. And I think I read, I, I think I read this essay by this um, woman about uh, in, her name is gone for me right now, but she wrote about Latin American conceptualism as opposed to the difference between that and Euro-American conceptualism, um, you know, sort of beyond the fantastic there is coming. Oh, Marie yeah. Yeah. Ramirez. Okay. That era was Marie coming. Carmen. Marie Carmen, that, of course. That, the road to that was coming. <laughs> and then I realized, wait a minute, you know, um, it's better to be outside than inside. For that. So there's a kind of unlearning that you have to arrive at. And then I started coming to terms with the fact that some of these drives, I was being forced into this sole producer uh, genius kind of model of what constitutes an artistic practice. And uh, when I said no, I, I had to start thinking about how I'm working with the community. And the templates were there in the Caribbean all along. In Nassau, you have the John Canoe, the John um, secret societies and things that, in Trinidad, it was the carnival. <coughs> you know, the carnival producer is um, not a sole producer, is a man with an idea, or a, mm -hmm. he kind of instigates others to follow it, and next thing you go, from a few sketches on paper to 4,000 people going through the street doing something. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I, this is fascinating. So, I, so um, it's only when Alice Yard did come along though, which is from about um, 2006 that I really started to come to terms through <clears throat> organizing the yard and working with artists. And because very often how the, how the template works is an artist would come tell us, I want to do this, it would fall apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and we would arrive at something, <coughs> but the something works even better than what they said they wanted to do. And then that becomes the DNA of projects that happen in other parts of the world. You know, so you have mm -hmm. people like Ebony Patterson would come and say, I want to do this. It's just a disaster, but then it shows up in some other part of the world or Charles Campbell or somebody else. <laughs> and um, so we're kind of like the DNA of, a, of a, something instigated. And then for my own practice, I started thinking, well, okay, I now understand this thing. This is what I was really striving for all along. And I think in terms of um, what, you know, Tavares is talking about, I think um, the more we unlearn, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's more we get true to ourselves and then we find a kind of greater sense of direction. And, but, but we are still struggling, because we are, when I say we're still struggling, um, we are sites of extraction, for lack of a better term. You know, um, the history of the Caribbean is about, I mean, we don't even know why we're there. You know, we were transplanted <laughs> to create wealth for people elsewhere. The yeah. Caribbean were industrial labor camps of Europe, a kind of rehearsal for all the nastiness that happened in other parts of the world much later, like in Nazi Germany or wherever. We were the rehearsal ground. And, um, you know, so there's a kind of way in which we are walking on this site, and it's going to be either a site of future or it's mm -hmm. a ruin. You decide. It's a ruin or a site of the future, mm -hmm. right? It's a, a compost, so to speak, <laughs> of history. And, um, so in, in a way, when, we, when, when one's vision becomes clear, uh, which has been a lot what I've been going through, um, the unlearning of this demand to be something at the juncture of exchange mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, is when we realize, wait a minute. Um, but, but you're feeling this conflict because we, things leave here and become commodified, case in point, mm -hmm. glissant. You know, we Absolutely. grew up, I mean, we exactly. grew up reading Absolutely. Glissant, and now I have to get on exactly. a plane for somebody to lecture me about Glissant. Exactly. You know, they just discovered Glissant, and I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to discover Sylvia Winter, maybe it's too late. And, <laughs> and so and we go. And so we go to um, the Recualto, yeah, yeah. to Aimee <laughs> um, yeah. and everything. Sorry. I mean, I'm being very cynical, sorry, I'm, yeah, I'll stop and it. Fernando Ortiz and Lydia Cabrera. Who else, you know? And maybe. yes. Yeah. yeah. That, and then it's sold back to you, and then suddenly, oh, you, you need to get more advanced thinking. Have you read this <laughs> quote by Glissant? <laughs> <laughs> um. But it's very suspicious. Sometimes I'm, I'm going to um, dis, uh, make a dissonance here. But it's very suspicious that uh, suddenly um, so all these uh, studies on uh, cultural studies, suddenly have discovered uh, France Fanon, I miss it, uh, mm. Derek Walcott, and so on. And it is very suspicious that in Zurich yeah. it, it's being studied. Yeah. Um, so this is only, only has like 15 years or so because I'm very old and I'm, uh, I'm, I know about that. So it's, it's very strange. Sometimes it's suspicious, and I don't want to be But it's, it's been part of the unlearning like, process. Yeah, right? but it's like taken out of context, and then yeah. the whole idea of like that it was, that it was a Caribbean context that informed that thought gets mm -hmm. lost along the way. It, but that's uh, something also very interesting about the Caribbean, because we kind of infect other environments, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so viral. people are talking back to us as if it's theirs, not realizing we'd infected them long ago. You know? <laughs> And that's actually part of the process. So sometimes I, I, I'm nervous about sounding like, oh, I, you know, it seems like I'm heading down the road of appropriation. No, actually, I think that was the intention to infect. Yes. <laughs> because uh, we don't have bombs, we can't blow up cities, you know, um, so we have to infect with concepts. Hmm. And I think the older generation did that. CLR James, when he came here in the 50s, um, you know, Stokely Carmichael is the classic example, Marcus mm -hmm. Garvey, you know, who Marcus just called Garvey. the list. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. infect social mm -hmm. environments and their ideas become part of the transformational politics of, you could say, the hemisphere, and then it filters out into wider, you know, the, the influence of Padmore in Africa, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and you just keep going, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, but you said, you know, there's something also I, I would like to add to that. Even though um, it is true that we are the good virus, <laughs> in some way, uh, it is true because That's I can see I, I can see Jose Martin, Nicolas Guillen. I can see 
even the, the political thinking of Pedro Albizu Campos, mm -hmm. I, can, I can see hostos in every thing I re read now, but I think it's also very necessary to systematize the, uh, the Caribbean production of, of thought, um, because we have to foster the research uh, to put into context those kind of uh, thinking process. So it's not a surprise that uh, Awilda Sterling Dupre is in the Whitney Biennium. So it's not a surprise that we uh, have this kind of, of discourse, that we have Tavares and Chris work that it speaks too powerfully to, to people right now. So I think it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a homework that we need to, to, to do, actually, to systematize se seriously this kind of thought. There's readers, there's the Caribbean thought readers and, and all that, mm -hmm. that the um, University of West Indies have done very seriously. But also, we need to circulate that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Tavares, what, what? Yeah, I just, I mean, <laughs> Any thoughts? it's not a lot to add. I, I think, I feel like, for me, I have um, three questions. I think one's for you, mm -hmm. which is why are we here, mm -hmm. like on the stage today? Mm -hmm. uh, for my panelists and colleagues, why are we here? And for the audience, why are we here? Yeah. So like, are we, are we, are we, are we opening space for collaboration? Are we performing? Mm -hmm. um, are, we, are we engaging in warfare? Why are we here? So I think maybe we could talk about that at some point. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about now. it now. I mean, I think it's <laughs> then, a little bit of everything. I'm ready. Yeah, and then I, and then I think I have another, like another thought, which is most of my colleagues, um, most, of the, most of the artists that I know who um, identify as women or artists of color, they're, they're plural in their existence. They're, they're, they're artists, but they're also activists. Mm -hmm. um, they're also community leaders. They also build institutions. And I think we're in a moment where we should, we should think about how, when we think about what an artist is, mm -hmm. to maybe facilitate those thoughts through that lens. Yes. Because if, if the, the kinds of spaces that the young people in my neighborhood um, needed or were adequately placed, then I wouldn't, I maybe would have a different way of thinking or being in terms of being an artist. Mm. And so if you're an artist who have the privilege of walking around in a room in a white cube and, and measuring your body in space and that's your work, then that's great. Mm. But there, I think a part of what drives the majority of us on this, all of us on this stage is that the world is, is full, full of, of complex and real problems. Um, we have ice caps melting, um, we have wars, we have food insecurity. And I think the, the collision of poetry with reality, I think is what we're all after. And I think the plural existence that, it, that happens when you think of artists of color or women who are making, who happen to be making art, the reason why there's so many things is because we're dealing with so many things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the lack of privilege is actually the, the space where we find our privilege, right? to be able to reach into all of these ways of thinking and making and being. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of leave, yes. leave, leave that in the air. But also this question about why are we here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, why are we here? <laughs> I mean, at least for me, I mean, obviously I, I have a relationship with Loring and um, <laughs> in terms of like a friendship, a oh. friendship. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, both of us and, and many colleagues in the field are interested in, in having some very critical public conversations. I'm not sure if, if that's happening today in, in fully, um, but I think there's a certain, at least for me, and I know for many of us here on the stage, there's uh, so many expectations tied to myself as a curator, as what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to like and what different things I'm supposed to be doing in this art world in the US, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like, mm -hmm. like every time that there's like any person, either an artist or a curator that has a, t a particular type of heritage that doesn't seem like, you know, non-white, let's just say like a Caribbean heritage or even like Latinx, for example, that's a great example. There are certain expectations that come with that categorization, that come with that label. And I think mm -hmm. that in my work, 
as a curator, and that's why you know, I'm working with all of you three, I'm interested in challenging that legibility because um, there is so much complexity to who we are and to what that space means because even the question of what is the Caribbean, which we've talked about, I can't, we can't even get to a definitive answer. I think we spoke for like three hours in that conversation <laughs> through yeah. Zoom, and it's such a simple question. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanna get back to your question about performativity because it is really tied to this idea of expectation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I feel we all kind of embody in a certain point when we come to these spaces in the US because that doesn't necessarily exist in the Caribbean, right? It's an expectation well, it that comes a, it elsewhere. It exists in a different way, I think. Um, you know, like, it's interesting. When I was listening to Tavares talk, heading to where he's brought us, <laughs> <laughs> I thought about the property and, and about the territorialization, mm -hmm. you know, of everything. And, and, and here we find ourselves, um, the demand to be singular is a kind of counter narrative to the plural. Um, but the demand to be singular is significant to the commodification at the point of, at the juncture of exchange, right? And, and I think like when I did some curatorial experiments many years ago, I, I was attracted to an image by an artist from Nassau where he, he rendered himself wrestling with himself. And that inspired me to do a show called Wrestling with the Image. Because I think when you grow up in the Caribbean, you always feel that you, it's something, it's part of black experience, yes, and it's part of a wider experience in terms of the sort of hemispheric um, um, arrival or appearance. But you always feel that you're in this kind of wrestling match with a doppelganger um, uh, that is, in a sense, that sits in the field of expectations that other people have of you, right? So you're constantly, you know, it's like you're like a shadow boxer. So in a lot of my recent work, you know, you're asking me, where is the Caribbean? We think about the itinerancy, the dodge, mm -hmm. um, the refusal, you know, slipping back into Gisa, you know, because, because that is actually where, um, you know, it's a kind of internal struggle, but it's a struggle with the, the spaces in which we find ourselves. And it's, um, so this, this demand is, is a constant uh, negotiation. It's kind of part of the game. And, and, and the performativity is tricky because one would assume the performativity is in some way a weakness, but the performativity is also a game, a game that's older than ourselves. Um, I, I, sent a floor, I sent some uh, Instagram image to somebody in which they found what, what was called the floor show back in the 40s and 50s. And it's an image of the other Holder brother, not Jeffrey Bosco. And he's doing an African dance in London, uh, you know, with an ugly um, voiceover, British voiceover, in a nightclub. <laughs> and you know, it's kind of like, do, 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 really, really? You know, and the voice saying, yes, in the Caribbean, the African, da, da, da. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I mean, <laughs> but, but I know he's making his money and he's getting off the island, you know, it's going down. And this is a cultural hero, you know, because there's the, the one laughing on TV here when we were younger, ha, 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 seven up and he's in the James Bond movie. And then there's the other brother that's doing this who's a painter and I'm thinking, well, I can't, I'm not taking it. I, I can't, I wasn't living in their space. I don't know that dance. It's not required of me in the context in which I'm operating now but I'm still no negotiating with the new configuration of the old demand, hmm. you know, and, that, and that's come still, well, why the hell am I here? <laughs> do I know the dads? I don't know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> why are you know, here, Tavares? <laughs> um, I, you know, I think there's, there's the, the duality that you mentioned yeah. that I, I love. I think there's a piece of me that is, is has come through to treachery, which was my early childhood education, mm -hmm. and I'm still here. Um, and I think that's loaded with um, a lack of trust, mm -hmm. which makes sense. And then I think I'm filled with optimism. I feel like there's a, I think the thing that I, I'm hoping that we're sharing is consciousness, right? Maybe there's a set of ideas that we all in this room share, regardless of where we're sitting. And I think that's the space that I'm mostly interested in but I think sometimes that gets lost in the theater of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just think that for me, it's just like, can we make some room for us to share consciousness? A set of ideas that we all 
can overlap on, where we meet, where we're the same, how we're the same. It's the point of the I'm, glad, I'm glad that you said that because the reason why I'm here, <laughs> um, and I, I didn't save it for last, whatever, it's just, I take my job very seriously. I take my 30 something years in this uh, very seriously. And also I respect the artistic practices and what we have managed to do these years. So I'm coming here with the, with the idea of sharing meaningful ideas, to, to collaborate in something, to shed some light. It says models of our times. Maybe mine is not a model, but it's, it's the formula we found to do this, that it's evolving to another thing. But it's very important that this dichotomy that you said that, that you, you both stated of the idea of being here up in stage and performing what you have to say and saying what you need to say. So I take in the opportunity of saying that we are trying to find alternatives to education with the cautious and responsibility that we have to do, uh, then I'm open to share my experiences with everybody that we have 20 or so alumni in an amazing project of curatorial studies that doesn't have anything to do with those academic, I don't know, goldsmith and things like that. Yes, because it's not because it's better, it's because it's another place and respond to a different context and respond to a context where uh, it is necessary the collective construction of meaning. It is imp it's in impossible to, to exist or to work without the collective. And, it is also a context that makes you do a curricula totally different from a university in Europe. And it's also a, 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 a scenario that it has many obstacles, like everywhere right now. Because if something had happened this last year, it's in some way it has equalized the, 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 some of the problems and at least, I, I shouldn't say equalize because that's never true, but at least it has impacted more and more people. And they are as feeling like we have been feeling and, and taking the idea of what you say at the beginning that everything started in that uh, island of 48,000 kilometers squares and uh, that shares a, a country with Haiti and Dominican Republic is the, the, the island of San Domingo, or Santo Domingo. Uh, actually, we are circling the information back. We are making circles. And we are here to the circle. The, so the circle comes around. So maybe that's a good time to take any questions from the audience, if you have any for us. Oh my God. You got, you got all scared of us. <laughs> no, we're not going to fight. <laughs> Thank you all. This has been like really amazing. Uh, so I was thinking that maybe the thing that we're doing here is why am I here it, to start this for us all talk about is for to learn about how we can have how we can have more plurality and be more interconnected because we're all doing these things in our own little silos and we don't want to be this, we want to have the input so we have the sensitivity of working thoughtfully locally but also informed and supported by you know, our colleagues elsewhere. So that's, I think, where some of us are here and um, yeah, maybe there's a levels of performativity and um, some of it is authentic and some of it we feel like is a necessity for survival. That's hard to say and it's subjective between each of us, but um, I think what you're saying also rings clear for lots of people in other places in the world. It's really good to hear it, so thank you. That's not a question, that's just a question. <laughs> There 
first one up, up there. Hi there. Good, good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for a really interesting panel. Um, I had just one question. Somebody, I uh, can't remember which panelist it was, uh, brought up about the kind of co-opting of some of the writers and thought, thought leaders uh, from the Caribbean. So Franz Fanon uh, was, I think, brought up. Um, in terms of uh, European curators, perhaps latching upon this and, and so on. I'd, I'd just be really interested to hear a little bit more about that. I, I could have mentioned that. Um, I heard that. Yeah, you did? Okay. I, well, I, w I mentioned, it was mentioned in the conversation, but I don't want to focus on that because I kind of shifted it to say, well, it's not that we are, I, at least I was not trying to propose that it's the appropriation that I'm, because I think it's actually successful when mm -hmm. we infect these environments with these thoughts. Um, it's a bit interesting when it's sold back to us because the traditional history is that we are sites of extraction. Um, but actually, when you think of the Caribbean as a um, cultural space, it's not tied into geography because, as you know, Franz Fanon wrote most mm -hmm. of that stuff in Algeria. And, um, and if you think of some of the Caribbean, one of the things I'm very interested in now in my sort of looking at art. I'm, I've been thinking a lot about the geography of production. And it's interesting to have Tavares here because it, one of the artists from Nassau um, was the first person that had me thinking about that more precisely, um, which was, um, he did a piece called Temporary Horizons. That's, um, what's his name? <laughs> your, one of your colleagues from Nassau. Um, Temporary Horizons. Um, Schmidt. Schmidt, Schmidt yeah. Heino Schmidt. It's a kind of interesting situation. He, the, he came to Trinidad to do a residency and he noticed a guy on the side of the road balancing bottles to make money from people hanging out in a bar. He got in, at the same time, he was invited to participate in the Liverpool Biennial. So um, he studied how this guy was doing this, how he got these bottles to balance. So he became interested in the sleight of hand the kind of dexterity and the way to hustle to get money, right? So he goes to London um, to visit a friend, another Bohemian artist, Blue Curry, and in Blue Curry's studio, he masters the art of getting the two bottles to balance. And then that piece is presented in the, um, in the Liverpool Biennial. And it becomes a kind of tongue-in-cheek reaction to the responsibility of representing because um, it, it, there's a kind of return to the thought of the street side hustler. But it also coincided with the, a sense of feeling unstable, anxiety, mm -hmm. and it coincided also with the earthquake, earthquake in Haiti, mm -hmm. because the temporary horizon, it needs a little bit of water to keep the whole thing stable. So there's a kind of geography. So this work, what does the war label say? Right? Yeah. <laughs> this is a, what, a, a piece representing the Bahamas in the... Liverpool Biennial, but no, it's kind of gone across a big map. And I think Caribbean people have been on the move now um, mm. from our first displacement when they stole us from Africa, India, and China, and the Middle East, right? Mm. <laughs> so this, this kind of, of, of geography, um, as I said, Fanon wrote it, his, um, most of his stuff in Algeria. He was working mm. in a psychiatric ward somewhere. You know, so all of us are on the move, but when we get to that juncture of exchange, uh, institutional exchange is what I'm talking about. The yeah. demand for singularity, the demand for specificity of place, and then we have to make all these excuses and so on, mm -hmm. you know, for why we are inauthentically mobile, um, you know, and things like that. And I think so, the, I mean, the, the most important thing I think is that it's not that we're setting up a territory or a defense per se, no. is that we're seeing that um, we're giving everybody permission, everybody else moving around, we're moving around too. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what distinguishes late 20th century, <laughs> early 20th century, mm -hmm. 20, 21st century life? <laughs> but, but we were there a long time because. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The next question is what's your uh, proactive counter offer to the singularity of the artist? Like, we can say, okay, I want to participate as a collective. Mm -hmm. other but <laughs> can, I answer, can I answer yes. that? Because I, I feel like that's the question I was asking earlier. Yes. So, Mike, so that, I pushed that question back to you. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think what's interesting here is, like, on a very practical level, how many sh shows have been curated by institutions in the American and European context would actually take the time to visit the Caribbean, exactly. would actually take the time to form partnerships with thinkers in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, would, would look beyond the Caribbean diaspora or, or beyond artists represented by galleries in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So in other words, people are planning Caribbean shows and you almost have to convince them to come into the Caribbean. Yeah. And our question is, well, talk to us now. We're here. <laughs> We're here. We're here. I mean, yeah. But the, the idea also of the appropriation of, of Fanon and, yeah, but and everybody else, it just talks about the, uh, the amazing uh, actuality, how you say, like, like the, the presence relevance. of the yeah. relevance of yeah. those yeah. Uh, those writers uh, these days, so, so it's more than welcome that they yeah. quote them yeah. all you want. So mm -hmm. Because I problem. think people wouldn't do that. Now, this is the thing. That's the history of the Caribbean. I'm not complaining, huh? <laughs> uh, because, I mean, I hate to call his name, but let's face it, you know, Columbus came into the Caribbean and um, saw something, called it another thing, because he could get money. Right? So he was the first American, the first smart man. Right? Um, <laughs> he had to lie to get more money, you know, so he could go on with further expeditions. Oh, yeah. right? So the Caribbean was useful to him as a site to get money. And, um, and in, a, in a way, the expeditionary process kind of continues. There is a Caribbean that is understood out in these contexts in which people, that's, the arrangements could work with that concept. So there's no reason to look further. And there's a kind of recycling stagnation that goes on. Um, I mean, there had some breakthroughs in the last couple of years, but the ball is still turning. You know, the old ball is still turning. And we watch it because we know that's the game, you know? <laughs> so it's not that we are <laughs> stamping our feet and complaining. We say, well, all right. Okay. Go, as yeah, you say, okay. go through, right? Go ahead. Because <laughs> we, we have to get on with our own lives, you know, to feel seen and to mm -hmm. proceed with our agendas. It's right in front of you, so, you know, it's up to you. Um, you know, and, and I think that's the big challenge now. But more and more, I, I think, I mean, you know, people are, um, are sort of, because the Caribbean community is spreading, yes. and yeah. people are everywhere, institutionally, um, artists, for curators, for researchers, you know. People are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually now more kind of useful to say one has Caribbean origins. While I would say in the 80s, when I lived and worked in the US, um, it was almost like more a curse than a blessing. Yeah. You know? yeah. But everybody has a Caribbean great grandmother, grandfather, everybody uncle, friend. Caribbean. You know, everybody. it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that is done. Okay. It's so sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. We're, okay. We're past. Well, I'd love to continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carla, Tavares, Sarah, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.